on behalf of Prabhakhat. Foundation and welcome to another session of Kitab with Jyotsna Mohan. Prabha Khaitan Foundation is dedicated to all-round development of social, cultural, welfare, and humanitarian aspects of Indian society. It is a non-profit trust founded by late Dr. Prabha Khaitan, an eminent literator, philanthropist, social worker, and industrialist. Based in Kolkata, the organization promotes art, culture, and literature of India, and is engaged in many welfare activities with its associates for children, women, and the elderly. The organization collaborates with caregivers, committed individuals, and like-minded institutions to implement various cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare projects in the country. The objective of the foundation is to create an enabling structure and promote networking so that communities engage with each other to build up positive self-esteem, inspire creativity, and promote culture and knowledge. One of the prime initiatives of Prabha Khaitan Foundation is Ehsas, Women of India. The foundation believes that the women of today are the brigade of change for the times to come. And it brings together minds who think of a better future and pledge to make a difference. Ehsas is a conglomeration of women from all walks of life who are graceful in their own ways and inspire others for the betterment of the society and promote Indian culture. Now Fulkari is a leading women's organization in Amritsar and was established in 2017. It aims to strengthen women's participation in civil society, especially in the cultural, economic, and social fields with a member body of more than 300 powerful and influential women from diverse professions and walks of life, Fulkari is considered the premier think tank of the city. It provides a platform for meaningful and stimulating discussion and dialogue with an exchange of ideas. Fulkari is engaged in several philanthropic programs to strengthen civil society, including cancer awareness, education for the less privileged, environmental sensitization, etc. It is currently working towards making Punjab the first cervical cancer-free state in India. Fulkari is a holistic platform for the multifaceted women of today. When the world has paused, Prabha Khaitan Foundation has geared up its efforts to have patrons get a chance with talk to their favorite authors virtually. Patrons can now tune into from the sanctity of their home. The guest for the evening is Jyotsna Mohan. She is the author and has worked with NDTV for 15 years as a senior news anchor and senior news editor. She is a columnist for newspapers and digital publications in India and abroad. In a conversation with her is Nidhi Razdan, who's an associate professor of journalism at Harvard University, where she joined in September, 2020. Before that, she was a journalist for NDTV for 21 years and rose to the position of executive editor. Nidhi reported on politics and international diplomacy and anchored NDTV's primetime show, Left, Right and Center and The Big Fight. I request Ms. Josna Mohan and Ms. Nidhi Razan to unveil the book, Stoned, Shamed, Depressed. Now, may I request Ms. Nidhi to start the conversation while we sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and thank you for this invitation today. Uh, I've had the honor of actually being with Jyotsna when the book was first released a few months ago. And uh, Jyotsna, I wanted to begin by asking you that in this time, since the book has gone on to become a bestseller, uh, what are the experiences that other parents have shared with you based on what you were able to reveal uh, in this book, which just to remind those uh, who uh, haven't read the book or who are planning to read it, uh, is, is essentially an insider's account of the lives India's teenagers, particularly in our cities, tier one, tier two cities, the kind of lives that they are leading, which often uh, parents uh, don't have any idea about. So uh, Jyotsna, just asking you first off, uh, what, what's the feedback been like from other parents? 
You know, I feel like Nidhi, I could write a sequel right now, <laughs> given that so many have written in saying, oh, we wish you, we knew that you were writing this book. We had so many experiences to share and there's so many who've come out actually to say that. But, uh, you know, the ones who are most telling are the younger ones, you know, so many written in uh, without telling their parents or, or, you know, friends of ours, our common friends and their, their children have uh, called in separately to say that, you know, thank you for voicing our story finally. And, uh, you know, that finally someone's talking about the fact that we can have mental health issues or, you know, we can have the highs and lows just like an adult does. So I think it's it's a bit of a, a telling experience for me as well. You know, I feel I feel a little sense of I feel like, you know, I've accomplished something when I get these kind of feedbacks, you know, because I find that we've really not spoken about this generation or slightly older, uh, you know, people in their 20s. And I think the amount of people in their 20s who've written back to me has been amazing. It's been fascinating. But also there have been predictable reactions, uh, people telling me this is just, you know, hocus pocus and this is Western bullshit or I've exaggerated the vices. But that, that's been predictable as well, you know. You, you expect it because uh, that's exactly the reason why I've written it, to try and change mindsets because, you know, it's very easy to continue remaining in denial but uh, so the purpose has been to write it if, i mean these are uh, reactions that i expect but i think uh, on the whole really there's another book <laughs> out there but i'm not touching it well you know uh, your book touches on a whole range of issues that kids are facing whether it's eating disorders image issues mental health issues uh, addiction to gaming uh, bullying in school etc but when you know, you're a parent as well, so when you were writing this book and when you were interviewing people for it, is there something that surprised even you that really stood out? Something that's, that shocked you? Oh, many. Uh, I think case studies personally, but I think the larger picture was that uh, when I was writing it, I thought, you know, 18, uh, 17, at most 16 year olds and then going into first year college because, you know, that's a transitional age and they take a lot with them before, you know, the changes happen in college. But uh, where I ended up was actually, as I call it, battleground middle school. So, uh, you know, ages of, I've, been, I've written about issues of anorexia with eight-year-olds, gaming addiction of eight, nine-year-olds. That's something I did not see coming at all. So I, I was completely taken aback by the issues of 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old. And, you know, as a school principal told me, she said that, you know, senior school is out of my hands. All I'm trying to do now is to save middle school. And, you know, that, she says, is my focus because, you know, I, I can change them now. And I can't change senior school because they've already gone out of our hands. They do what they want to do. I mean, things have changed so drastically. But so that was a big, big shock for me that, you know, I mean, 10 year old, 12 year old kids are talking to me about, you know, eating disorders or having been blackmailed in school to such an extent that, you know, uh, that they have been forced to leave their way, you know, they've been forced to leave a sport that uh, they were practicing for years or leave a school or, you know, things have, become, have changed so drastically now that the fact that, you know, these kids can talk very casually about uh, self-harm is something that, you know, made me have very many sleepless nights, you know, Nidhi, I would, I would finish this writing and go back and, you know, go into my room and I was like, how do I sleep tonight, you know, if, I, if a child has told me that, you know, I've tried to kill myself because, you know, uh, that I, I couldn't get into the student council. And I, I, I have to sit and wonder why they've reached the stage they have, because this is not something I saw coming when I started to write this book either. So I think it's, it was a combination of the fact that the age of adventurism in a sort had dropped so drastically. And the fact that, you know, they, they are uh, playing with their lives so casually. So let's talk about some of the specific issues. And you, like you said, uh, uh, the image issues, for example, and, and you've written a lot about the, the sort of negative use of social media and, and, and this obsession that kids have with, with their image, with being on Instagram, and specifically about the role of parents, because I thought that was really interesting in the book, the way you've spoken about how parents often wittingly or unwittingly become party to this problem that their kids are having with regard to social media accounts, because they don't know what the right age is to get their kids onto say Instagram or Facebook or whatever. So take us through that, you know, to begin with, what, what was that experience like when you spoke to parents in particular? So, you know, I, I find that there are some parents who are completely involved and, you know, who know what's going on, but it, it's very tricky environment right now. I think kids are, kids are so different from how we were when we were growing up that 
you know, there's a girl, she was 13 or 12 and a half when I started writing the book. And, you know, she was, she was telling me everything very easily. <laughs> By the time I finished the book and I wanted to go back for something, she was 14 and she clamped up, you know. So it, it, the changes were happening in front of me and I could, I could sense, you know, the frustration of parents. Like oh, you, there's this woman who I'm in touch with even after writing the book. And her son was a topper and he, he finished, you know, top of the class in, uh, in school. And then he went abroad, he got into like a really good college and then he missed out on two years of college. Uh, because and she's still trying to figure out what is it that came first, you know, whether it was his bout of depression or the fact that, you know, uh, or it was the drugs because uh, and she says, you know, we, we were such an open family, not, you know, we discussed everything, we, nothing was hidden. And yet these issues cropped up and she's still trying to find, you know, figure it out. And I mean, she says, she says, I've got to deal with mental health first, you know, so the boy is still and he is I've spoken to him so many times, Nidhi. Every single one of these children so intelligent, they have so much potential, you know, he's, he's into activism and ironically, while well, you know, he's still having that joint openly in front of his parents, he's talking about drug awareness and activism in college today. And, and, and so these are the kind of parents that, you know, who are still on the ball and are struggling. So I find that if, you know, if you're not clued in, you can really be in a tough place as an adult today because uh, social media is something that uh, I think adults are also finding a bit of a, you know, I think we're still treating it a little bit like a toy ourselves. So if, you know, we are you sitting- talked about that, right? The, you know, how parents also want to put up the daughter's pictures or the son's photographs from the certain, you know, from the party they went to or the holiday they went to. So parents end up encouraging the very thing that, you know, then ends up being a monster they can't control. Absolutely, because I mean, so many of them, you know, the, the children are seeing, you know, if a parent is going to check in every single time into every little single personal detail, you know, while everybody's sitting next to them, this is exactly what they're going to emulate, you know, and, and they are, a lot of them are, because I mean, they don't think that there's anything wrong in, you know, putting up photos, and then it just, it, it expands into the whole, that freedom, that unrestrained freedom, then, you know, takes a life of its own eventually. So if you're allowing a child at the age of eight, nine, 10 to get onto social media, or you're giving them that phone or a gadget that early before they're even a teen, and then you're trying to take it back at the age of 13, 14, it's going to have repercussions. And it is because this generation is very tough. It's very tough to handle this generation. They're very tricky. They're very hard. And, you know, they don't give in very easily. And I mean, I personally know this gentleman doing really, I mean, from a really, you know, the, both the parents are professionals in Bangalore and he gave both his children an iPad really early, I think, you know, at the age of six, seven. And now the 13 year old boy is a he's pretty much a monster to deal with because you know fellow parents in school have complained they've had the police at their doorsteps you know uh, complain uh, with complaints against this boy and they're trying to take away this ipad and they're finding it extremely difficult now because the boy is resisting any change so i find that you know it's very very easy to give in for all of us but it's very hard to say no and i say that as well in my book because i know i quoted uh, steve jobs they're saying that you know the hardest thing to do in life is to say no because when you say no you piss off a lot of people and it's somehow easier for us in today's generation to say here take a gadget take your space we're all we all need our space and i think unfortunately you know uh, it, it has repercussions in the course of writing the book though and talking to parents and even even kids uh is there a is there a right age for kids to be having social media accounts from your experience or a or a right age for them to be uh, or you know accessing the gadgets or having their own cell phones because the world has changed a lot when you and I grew up there was no question of you know there, there were no cell phones right until we were in college so we can give our age away now but uh, like what what from your experience and from what you gauged uh, you know what advice would you give if you had to uh, about what the best time is to to equip your kids with this because they they, they will ultimately you know use these things so, so I always say that any parenting advice I give is personal because like I said, it's not a parenting book and really, uh, you know, very few people do want advice. But my sense is the longer you can push it, the better it is for your child. And, uh, you know, every, every, every few months makes a difference in, in, on, on, in cyberspace, frankly. And I, I see no business for a 10-year-old to be on social media or even get a phone of his own. I really don't. 
And uh, I practice what I preach. My children, my eldest one is 12 and my younger one is eight and they're not on social media. And, you know, I feel vindicated in a sense because it's not like uh, I don't get pressure. I get, I get enormous pressure from the elder one. Maybe all her friends have been on Instagram for like, the last two years, you know, and uh, she's perpetually saying, can I be on Instagram? Can I please at least let me be on something? So I, I'm, I'm in Abu Dhabi, right? I, and TikTok is not banned here for now. And so, you know, when they were meeting some friends, they're constantly, everybody's on TikTok, you know, 10 year old girls, 11 year old girls, eight year old girls, all they do is, uh, you know, they, they do TikTok videos. So one fine day, you know, they were really upset. They said, we're not on anything. We're not on anything. Can you please allow us to be on TikTok? And, you know, we, we feel the pressure. So we understood, you know, it's very hard keeping that balance. So I, my husband, he was like, okay, for now, <laughs> you know, we, we, we'll, we'll allow your private account. And they were like, so what, what are we going to do with a private account? You know, no one's going to be seeing us except those two, three people. And again, my husband was like, either take it or leave it. And so then they were like, okay, let it be. They didn't do, do anything with it. And one fine day, they come back from that same girl's house and they were like, oh, uh, okay, I think you can delete TikTok. Very sheepishly, you know, both of them. And we said, why? No, just delete it. And later it turns out that while the girls were there, and luckily these girls didn't see it, but the rest of these 10 year olds were on TikTok and there was a live suicide that was streamed and these 10 year old girls were sitting in shock because they'd just seen a man kill himself. And then the parents uh, all deleted the TikTok account. My point is, why did you put it in the first place? As parents, it is our responsibility to understand that, you know, there are all kinds of things that are going on in cyber world. I mean, do we want to expose a 10 year old to a life killing, which I mean, just they just did and i mean imagine the kind of scars that go on and and there are and there are multiple challenges that are shooting on cyber world so i, I mean i can't say that a 15 year old you you can stop that person from getting on a phone or a social media but i do know people who who haven't done it and i do find that you know in the western world where it all started from there is this reverse trend where a lot of parents are seeing that we're not giving our child a phone to their 15 uh, 16 or if we are giving them a phone which i actually really agree with then you know it is the, the purpose of the phone is to track your child that phone does not need to have a youtube that phone does not need to have a, not a smartphone. yeah it is not it just has to be a simple phone that does the work of a phone right and i think i think that 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 has a lot of merit in it so uh, another thing you wrote written about in the book which is linked to this whole new world of you know cyberspace is cyber bullying and a lot of the accounts that you've talked about are actually pretty spine chilling you know the way you know kids who are in their mid you know 13 14 year olds are literally you know bullying and blackmailing their fellow classmates uh, we've seen some cases that have been reported in the newspapers but tell us about you know how widespread this is this kind of cyber bullying which is not the typical schoolyard bullying that we grew up with it's all changed, you know, it's changed, it's changed so drastically, it's really scary, actually. Uh, and, and I find it very ironical, because, you know, these kids are so happy that, you know, when they're on Instagram, we've got that 10k, we've got that k auntie, you know, Instagram is how they tell me, right? And then ironically, they have no friends in real life, you know, there are no interactions. I mean, so many 20 year olds I spoke with, how many friends do you have? I've got two friends. And that, that's actually the reality of what is really going on in cyber world. So, you know, to give you an example of this whole cyber slash sexual bullying, because I find that there's a very fine line sometimes, uh, you know, that, uh, there's, so a girl, she started dating another boy in school and the girl's best friend just got upset because she felt that, you know, she was not getting the attention she need, she, she was used to. So, uh, she just went one fine day down to the chemistry lab where she thought the boy and the girl were getting intimate. And, you know, through that little glass in the door, she recorded them getting intimate and then went and uploaded it, uh, you know, behind that whole anonymous facade. She actually uploaded her best, uh, best friend's uh, intimate footage. And, you know, this is how easy it is and how casual and how simple their lives are. It's all so instant. They're not thinking about the repercussions, which is very scary. And, you know, I say that to a lot of children that I meet, you know, think twice before you put up what you put up. Because, you know, you're putting up these photos at the end of the day, you know, when you, you are going to go and get out of this phase eventually, you are going to go look for a job. And nobody's going to ask you for a CV because everyone's going to track you on your social media. And what they're going to see is going to convince them whether you can have that job or not. But they don't care right now, you know. They're, a, they're small. I think they're just living for the moment. And like I said, that it's a toy for them because it's a toy also for their parents. Linked to that, 
in a way is is the sort of uh, the, the the chapters where you talked about uh, how teenagers now have sex lives i mean you know who who would have thought that you know 14 15 year olds are getting sexually active and it's bringing with it its own set of complications uh, tell us about that and how parents are dealing with that because it is a very tricky issue it is it's so casual again you know it's it's like you know in our time we would send one little chitti one little note you know if we had a crush on someone through like five channels with hands taking that better right and for now it's like so if you've not lost your virginity by the time you're 15 or 16 you're not cool and you're not popular and you're not part of that gang so for a lot of girls i sense that you know this was something that had to be done just to get it out of the way just so that they could be part of the cool thing that is going on in school and it's it's really that casual and uh, you know i was having this talk earlier today about the fact that you know about teen pregnancies as well and where you know where does it leave us and uh, i i mentioned that a, a bit in the book you know that we because we don't acknowledge it we're still not anywhere near a solution because if you don't accept things you're not going to look for a solution and that's the one difference that i find between us you know countries uh, like uh, the us and back home because they've figured out what they can tackle and what they can't they figured out that there is this is something that they cannot tackle but teen pregnancies is something that they can so you know even 16 year olds are allowed to get into the school pharmacy or you know into the medical into the infirmary and ask for a pill morning um, uh, the morning after pill right and i have parents friends of mine have told me that even they don't have access after the age of 16 to their child's medical records but here in india we we can can you imagine a child going up into the infirmary and saying i need that pill i mean can you just imagine the kind of furor that would go across schools homes families we don't we we are still very far away from accepting the fact that some children could just make it you know it could just be a mistake that you know curiosity is part of growing up and we are always looking at it as you know a stigma and it's really sad also but maybe a lot of these children are aware of what they're doing so they know that you know sometimes we need help we need to go to a clinic and they say that but if we're not told where to go you know unfortunately we we go into these shady places but because we don't know where else to go and no one is taking us so that has repercussions as well because you know that is unhealthy in its own way and but but they 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 know that they need help they know that you know i mean a school teacher went and spoke to this topper who was uh, you know found getting intimate and this uh, uh, child turned around and told the teacher i i know what i'm doing i'm on pills you know i'm not going to get pregnant so they're very aware of what they're doing but i think they need assistance and i think boundaries need to change and i think thinking needs to change a little bit and we have to also figure out what what we can control and what we cannot what do you say to those people like you said you got all kinds of feedback about the book in the last few months but to those people who say that these are the problems of the elite uh, that these are problems that only a small minority of india's kids are facing how would you respond to them i have to tell them that any anybody with that smartphone in their hand is equally exposed today i say that and i say that i and i mean it i say that about tier 2 cities i say that about semi urban uh, cities and towns and i say that maybe the problems are different in different places but the issues the exposure remains the same in some places i mean look at the reach of pubg before it was banned it was across the smallest towns of the country it had repercussions it had you know people killing themselves because they couldn't get a, you know because their parents couldn't afford a phone for 37000 because they you know they wanted to play that particular level on the phone so the, the 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 problems may be different but the problems are very much there across and i think given that we are going to be 848 million smartphone users by 2022 largest market you know and and with the, the most the youngest population in the world i think we have issues, we have issues on our hand across the board so you talked about pubg and i have to say i'm not a parent but when i did read the book the chapter that actually stood out for me the most was the one on gaming and the kind of dangers that lurk uh, when when we don't uh, as parents realize that you know we think our kids are playing a game online but behind the scenes there's so much more that's going on uh tell tell us a bit more about that and what lessons parents can learn from that Yeah, so I, you know, I told you this before as well, Nuni. No? That I actually wrote this as the last chapter, thinking that you know it's it's going to be the lamest chapter in my book, and you know there's going to be uh, you know I've got to struggle to write it, so I kept pushing it to the end, and then I finished it, and I was it was a revolution for me, you know. It actually 
I was taken aback myself by the kind of uh, stuff that I found while uh, writing this chapter. While you know, the fact that it is no longer you know just a game for our children. Well, I think a lot of parents and during COVID now are understanding that you know there are issues around uh, too much of gaming. But I think even now they're just seeing the physical aspect of it. You know, children who are getting nightmares or who are getting headaches or you know their back and their neck and their fingers tingling. And that, that's what they're seeing. But there's just a whole lot of stuff that cyber experts are warning about. Uh, the fact that we're overlooking. And I think the biggest one continues to be privacy, which I think is applies to both uh, gaming and social media. And I think it's, uh, it's totally underestimated by parents. Uh, I think a, a lot of mothers that I spoke with, uh, you know, they just said that privacy is collateral damage. And I think that's unfortunately a very easy way out. Because what's going on in gaming is that uh, if it's a multiplayer game and you have 40, 40 people playing that multiplayer game. 20 of them may not be who you think they are. And it's it's really as simple as that. These are strangers who are getting onto chat. These are strangers who are, you know, uh, they, they, they uh, what they do is they build the child's trust. So if a child is actually looking to move up a level and needs some coupons or, you know, something, some a stranger will perk in and say, okay, wait, you know, I will help you and you can get in. And uh, so, I, and that, that's how they build trust. And they build trust through these pop-up chats. And then they take the conversations outside to WhatsApp. So, you know, like a mother who walked in to see that her child, a seven or eight year old child was speaking to a shirtless man. And, you know, luckily she got in right in time, but this is how they do it. You know, they're shirtless. And then eventually they, they, they encourage these young seven, eight, nine, 10 year old boys who are playing Fortnite to come out, you know, do the same thing as them because, you know, you giggle and you laugh and, Nobody's, I mean, these are kids, right? And then you record them and then it goes into this whole pedo, pedophile ring and it is huge. I mean, if we think that pedophilia is a Western concept, we have got to rethink our you know, priorities. We've got to rethink and reread because it is happening everywhere. Pop-up chats, you know, a lot of cyber experts warn that these pop-up chats are a dead giveaway to what is going on in your house because, you know, they will talk to a child and you know, they'll, they'll casually ask your child, so what does your parent do? And that, you know, the child will say, oh, I'm home alone at this time because, you know, my parent, this one works, my mom also works. This, these are the kind of things that cyber experts are warning about, you know, warning to parents that A, do not let your children or yourself have very easy passwords. B, keep walking in when they're gaming to see who they are playing with. C, try and see that, you know, those pop-ups are not vocal, you know, that the volume is down, that they're not communicating in person with strangers and people they don't know. So grooming is a very, very big issue. And I think uh, it's scary, but there's another aspect to it as well, Nidhi, and that is the aggression that is coming out through children who are playing. And uh, this is again, because they're, they're getting involved in a lot of uh, aggressive games, you know, Clash of the Titans and all these kind of games, extremely, extremely aggressive. So if you're playing for 10 hours, eight hours, you tend to take it back with you, right? You're, 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 you're becoming a bit like that. So, so many children, you know, so many incidents like this mother, uh, this, this boy, he asked his mother to, uh, you know, charge his phone because he wanted to play the game and she purposely didn't do it because she wanted him to take a break. And uh, he didn't know that, but he realized his phone wasn't charged. So he picked up the phone and he hit his mother with the phone. Or, you know, the fact that this other boy who was not allowed to play anymore, just kept getting aggressive and started hitting his parents and, you know, breaking things in his house. So all these are very real issues today. And also the issue of drugs. Again, scary to know as a parent that, uh, you know, it's become such a common problem even in schools. I mean... Did, you know, again, did that come as a bit of a surprise? So, you know, vaping didn't come to me as a surprise, you know, one part of it, uh, because I had heard, <laughs> my daughter was in class five, you know, Nidhi, when she, when, when, when three boys from her class were asked to leave for, because they were caught vaping in the corridors. And uh, so luckily for me, uh, we'd already, you know, that's what we do. We do, we practice that at home. We, we uh, normalize existence of things, you know, so it, both my girls know that even the eight-year-old, she may not know what vaping is. She knows it's something. She knows she shouldn't get involved with it. So we, we've tried to normalize the fact that drugs happen. Things happen in society. You know, vaping is happening. It's rampant across schools in urban India. And uh, so it didn't, it did, vaping didn't take me uh, down at all. But, you know, it was fascinating the kind of reaction that I got from parents who said that, you know, uh, 
every single parent that I, I mean, I, I can, I personally went to people whose children I knew the school had flagged down for raping. And I said, listen, does your son in class 12, does he, uh, you know, does he know anything about raping? And the instinctive reaction was like, oh no, what are you talking about? My child is not involved, he has no idea. And I said, just talk to him once, you know, just talk to him. No, I don't need to, I know he doesn't know anything about raping. There's that complete denial that remains, uh, you know, uh, even amongst the educated people. And that's, that's a bit worrying because uh, things have really, really changed. I mean, kids are exploring uh, drugs, and unfortunately, you know, my sense when it came to hard drugs or, you know, or okay, I mean, it depends on how you see weed, but okay, marijuana and, you know, moving on to cocaine and stuff was the fact that for a lot of these children, it was actually not uh, recreational. Really. They actually felt that they don't have a choice in what they're doing. So, and we can't, you know, as a society, we very easily judge people, you know, if that MMS scandal happened, you know, all those years ago, or those bad children, you know, we just dismiss them. And I think we see, oh, those, that, those children, you know, what kind of children are they? They're on drugs. But well, we've got to look closer because, you know, not just the backbencher, but the topper is on drugs too right now. The backbencher is trying to keep up with that 100% in LSR, you know, so is getting those the, the joint to keep awake the whole night to study and meet the standards of, an, you know, of, of society, of school, whether that person has the ability to or not. The topper is having that joint to keep up with the cool crowd because he doesn't want to be the nerd who is not, you know, who's shunned by everybody else because, you know, it, it, it is blasphemous to be a nerd or a geek today. And I mean, a 13 year old, I spoke with Nidhi and I said, so, you know, who started having marijuana at the age of 13? And I said, but why, you know? So these are intelligent children. So he said, you know, I knew, I knew that it's legal in certain parts of the world. I've read about its medicinal capabilities. So I actually, you know, I got into it and I said, let me give it a try. He said, but initially it was just that, but not, then it became an experience enhancer as well. So I said, what do you mean? And he said, you know, every time I would even go to a movie, I would take a joint before going to the movie. And I said, why is that important? Why is it that not just, you know, not just sitting in the movie experience is good enough in itself? And he said that, you know, all of us have a void in ourselves. And, you know, if, the, if, there, if there was a void that was filled in another way, we don't need to resort to these things, you know. So we are dependent on things that make us feel happy. And that, that's telling in a way as well. So my last question then, uh, Jyotsna, is that when you look at us, all these issues together, it somehow sounds like to someone like me who doesn't have kids that maybe I'm better off with <laughs> two dogs. But is, you know, like, how do you balance out all, all the scary stuff with what is obviously a wonderful experience to have kids and, and you know, to bring them up? How do, you, how do you sort of put all of this into context? And, uh, and for parents out there who read the book or who might be listening today who feel a bit frightened by what they hear, how can, how can they keep that balance you know, and, 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 and be sane? You know, I always say that conversations are key. Conversations at home, communication channels at home, they, I think that that is the crux. And I find that increasingly, I think we're all forgetting to sit with our child and, you know, sit and spend that quality time. But I think a lot of parents here maybe will notice that, you know, we dismiss, a lot of our children come up to us sometimes and they say, can you please play a board game? And we're so tired ourselves. We're like, no, no, I'm on my Instagram. Just do what you want to do, you know. And I, I want to be on my Twitter or whatever. And, you know, you just let it go. And But you actually, you know, then you're missing the signal because you, they would rather play that board game with you than, uh, than be in a position that allows them to constantly sit on the phone till it becomes a habit. I mean, so many children who talk, talk to me, Nidhi, they, and I ask them this question, so what's your relationship with your phone? And they said, it, it, it's complicated. You know, we, we would rather not be on the phone many times, but now it's become a habit. And it's, it's, it's an addiction. So, you know, we, we try and keep it away and do other things, but, you know, ultimately we just pick it up because it's the whole FOMO, right? And we don't want to be missing out on something. So I say that, you know, communication, keeping things open, like I said, demystify the existence of things, you know, take away the stigma. So what if somebody got intimate in school? Things happen, mistakes happen, you know, ch children, I mean, you know, children experiment go give that child a hug, you know, I mean, remember, even our friend Monica, she that I, I, I you know, and she, she wrote in the book as well, and she went and she said, you know, even the parents, go give the parents a hug, why ostracize the parents, but we tend to do this, and I think it's the bo bottom line is A, that, and I think that unrestricted freedom that we've given our children when it comes to social media, without us knowing social media properly, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it has its drawbacks, so either we have to up our tech game, 
And uh, so that, you know, we know where they are and we're a step ahead of them because it's very easy. <laughs> I'm the first one who say, oh my God, I'm struggling. And, you know, I'll call, I'll call the girls and say, oh my God, this IGTV video is not uploading. And they're not on social media, but they'll do it like this because they are this generation, right? They, they can do everything uh, on, on, on a device. But uh, so I think these are certain things and learn to say, no, I, I do. I mean, uh, how many times? <laughs> it's, it's frustrating. One time, two times, <laughs> six times I'm tempted to say yes, but I'm still saying no, no, no Instagram, no. I so, think yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's great advice. It's great advice. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, I guess with all those challenges out there, like you said, if you have the right balance and you're able to keep an eye uh, and keep your eyes open as a parent about what's going on in your child's life, don't just leave them to their own devices, quite literally, but just be far more involved in their lives. So great talking to you, Jyotsna. I think there are a lot of questions that have come in for you. So I'm going to just hand it over to Shweta uh, for that question and answer round. Thank you, Nidhi. I think Shweta's on mute. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Nidhi. The conversation was really amazing and it was really good to hear both of you. The tips were amazing. So I'll come to the first question. Uh, that is, uh, did the boys' locker room scandal impact your book? That's oh, it was it was one of the last things that I wrote actually. I, I had to <laughs> I had to actually call back my proofs and say, you know, this has just happened. Let me add this and mm -hmm. uh, and send it. So I did add this right. It is pretty much the last thing that I added to my book. And yes, I've mentioned it for the simple reason that you know it was part of what I was talking about. I mean, this book is actually written with an undercurrent of the fact that we are a, patri a patriarchal society, that, you know, misogyny exists rampantly across our society, and, you know, that it is filtering down into the younger generation as well. So I think it, 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 it was good in a sense that in, in, in terms of timing that it just happened, and I was able to talk about it. But again, uh, you know, like the whistleblower told me that this is just one instance. If you look closely at schools and colleges, they're full of locker rooms. And unfortunately, again, we, we don't, uh, you know, we don't uh, go beyond the whole sensationalism of these issues after, after nobody remembers it anymore, you know. And I think that was another reason I wrote this book. Right, absolutely. So the next question is from Shamal Bakne. And the question is, nowadays teens are getting involved in masturbation. How should we tackle this? And how should we control their sexual urge? You know, again, I think this is something that was uh, uh, the counselors spoke about. And I think, again, I also think that, you know, the, the school sessions on sex education, A, they need to change, B, they need to broaden up and C, they need to be earlier than they are right now. Uh, and I think uh, it, a lot of these in, this information needs to come from schools. Sex education, unfortunately, right now is still very, at a very nascent stage. You know, a lot of a lot of children I spoke would say that you know they don't really learn much from schools. And again, I mean, parents still think that you know they're going to have the bees and a birds conversation when the child is 12, 13, up to the train has long left the station. You know, so these conversations need to start. And I think uh, uh, as parents, we need to uh, you know be more proactive and take these conversations forward and take them very early now and you know explain to them you know as, as a porn addiction you know porn addiction also comes from that place where you have to teach your child there's a time and place for everything you know and I think uh, it, it's a big worry as well for families right now that you know 10 year olds are watching porn right um, uh, we'll take the raised hand question now uh, Sushma Malik can we have her Sushma Malik No, I think she's not there. Okay, I'll read out the next uh, She one. needs to yeah. unmute herself, actually. Okay. Sushma ji, please unmute yourself. Ananda Dash, can I take up the next question then? Yeah, Shweta, there are questions uh, on the yeah. Q&A box. Yeah. yeah, we'll take up that. Take the first yeah. to Dr. Rupa Dilon and Tina Binder. Yeah, let's take up from uh, Kirandeep Kokor, right? It takes a community to raise a child. What advice do you have for the parents and schools on how to work together and grapple with the issues of internet search? Oh, I, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, there's something that's going on these days, what I call playground politics, where a lot of parents are, you know, interfering in how children handle each other. I think personally, a lot of us need to take a step back and let our children figure out their battles in school. And I think that is hampering the way schools are dealing with children because today they're, they're a bit worried of, you know, 
taking up issues when it uh, involves children because they're worried that you know the parents are going to land up at the school gates. So I think firstly, uh, we need to take a step back and let children offline handle their issues and their battles. But online, I think uh, I think parenting communities need to talk together in the fact in, in in a sense they need to understand as well where the children are coming from. You know, it, it's very it's very difficult. To give you an example, you know, my children, they lose out on a lot of play dates for the simple reason that nobody wants to come over because I don't allow them to just sit with an iPad. And uh, I actually find that, you know, and then my, my children get really upset because, you know, if they're no longer friends with them, they'd say, how are you still friends with the parents? And I mean, they, 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 I understand where they're coming from, but I also tell them, you know, that you find your kin as well. You'll find the same kind of, you know, you, you'll find that kinship going forward. And, you know, you'll find similar people just because, you know, you're not sitting on an iPad doesn't mean that, you know, there are no other people who, who don't do it either. And they do find that it's slower because, you know, majority of the children today are just sitting with a gadget and that's their answer of a play date. So I think it also comes down to parents. But I mean, you know, if a parent is okay with it, what can you say? Right. Can we have the question from Tina Binder? Shweta, she has written the question on the Q&A box. No, Can you read it out, please? No, no, the question is not there. The question is from Deepta and Atula. No, uh, the second uh, unsupervised youngsters pose a threat. Just... No, it's not there, Anandita. I sent you in the chat box as well. Yeah, okay, I'll read from the chat box. So the unsupervised youngsters pose a threat and since the culture of Finsta is in vogue, how as a mother of a teenager can I curb the influence and addiction this social networking is causing? By not giving them an account, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually think that, you know, uh, just, uh, I think COVID has really also uh, paid, uh, you know, has also complicated matters quite a bit. And I think, uh, very but I think I, I but I think that you know uh, we've got to look at the brighter side of it because once before COVID a lot of children were obsessed with their gadget and you know they were constantly only wanting to sit with a gadget and not go out but ironically now all they want to do is go out in the park and meet some friends you know so hopefully things uh, we have to look at the brighter side of things but I, I I feel that you know when things change it's always good to encourage them to play a sport always always good I encourage my children to do it because I think that pent up energy you know it, it gets taken care of and uh, yeah, and then push it. I mean, I understand that you, your child cannot be ostracized, but trust me, then they won't be the only one who doesn't have a phone or an Instagram account. There will always be some others like them. It's about bucking the trend and it's very easy to give in to peer pressure. But you know, if I'm not giving in, you can do it too. Yeah, that's true. Why give them an account in the first place? Yeah, so my next question is from Dr. Rupa Dhillo. And the question to you is, teens are looking for places where they can release their stress without being corrected or judged. As a parent, if I'm unaware of this, am I a permissive parent? Do I need to know about their life completely? How do I discern the level of privacy that I need to give them? Yeah, you know, I think privacy is, <laughs> I think a lot of them are taking advantage of this whole privacy thing now. So I think we've really got to be, I understand privacy and, you know, my child will be like, mama, privacy, privacy, you know, but I think it is okay to keep walking in, uh, you know, for a, for a certain age. I mean, after a certain age, you can't, but, you know, I mean, right now, 12, 13, 14, yes, of course, you know. Uh, and keep walking in to see what they're doing. And, uh, you know, it, I, I always think that, you know, give one step and take two back. And that's my theory. You know, I pretend that I'm giving you something. It's the same thing that I do with gaming. I mean, I've set such low standards, you know, half an hour of gaming a, a week that, you know, if they, if they push it and they say, okay, 10 minutes or five minutes more, I said, yeah, sure, why not? Take it. You know, because my standards are so low that, okay, I can give you 40 minutes in a week, you know, and that's what I do with everything. So I think, you know, privacy is, again, it's the same. I mean, I understand that there's privacy and I, I, it's not like I'm constantly barging in. I also have those signs, please knock before you enter the door, you know, kind of thing with my children. But uh, uh, I think freedom unrestricted right now is, 
has has uh, you know it's a double whammy so we need to i think everybody needs to judge uh, how much they can trust their own child and uh, actually trusting the child is also a whole different ball game because it's not very easy to trust this generation right now and uh, i honestly also think that you know youtube i think is the, is one of the biggest disasters monitor what they do on youtube do not i do not let my children go on to youtube without asking me what they're watching because you know it's everything is one hyperlink away so you know they're watching something from that they'll tap onto something into something that will come on the corner and you know before you know it this is where they started and this is where they are so i i actually think that youtube is something that where you know you, you can take away all that privacy to see what they're doing right so the next question is from ashish how to talk to teenagers to be aware of people with sick minds approaching them and most of these cultures are they near and dear ones Yes. So yeah, you know, this is something that one of the cyber experts uh, also mentioned in the book, uh, and you know, he, he he talked about the fact that you know when these children are going over for sleepovers, and uh, you know, uh, how how do you really know? You know, anything? Do you really know that uncle inside out? He says because I have actually had to deal with instances like this. where you know kids are going for sleepovers and you know things are getting recorded or you know things are a bit out of control and you think you know the family but you actually don't so you have to you know really really be careful about where we're exposing our child today i i i i actually think twice before doing anything you know honestly speaking and so i think it it comes down to again how uh, how involved we are with our children to to know where they are how involved we are with cyber world ourselves to know what all goes on because there's just so much going on today so much so much you know how do you teach a child to not accept a stranger's request you know on on instagram because they they are just doing it left right and center i mean they they are they're clicking their photos you know intimate photos and they they think that you know it's they're just sending it to somebody on snapchat and you know because in 10 seconds it will disappear but again they don't realize that someone is actually recording it on a smartphone and then releasing that all over the place and this is exactly how it reaches ha the hands of the strangers who then turn around to blackmail them so many children i spoke to are getting blackmailed right now for having released their nudes so i think it 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 it's really is about you know instilling it in your child that you know that age old thing that we used to say ki bhaa stranger se baat mat karo it is the same thing on social media and on cyber world you know it's it's the same thing online and offline uh, don't get connected to strangers yeah. be away from them absolutely very true because, because they're all over you know they they're in different gangs whether it's gaming whether it's in instagram you know they or whether it's you know on anything i mean they're all over sexual bullying everywhere everywhere i think kids have to be very cautious now Right. and parents have to educate them at every point so it's hard to be cautious when you're 11 12 you know it, it is hard it you you have to be a, a, you know that that's why i say push it as much as you can because a child who's 15 may be able to deal with it better than a child who's 13 so every few months makes a difference uh, in cyber a uh, cyber space yes absolutely i think they need to counsel them every moment that's the need So we have another question um depression and anxiety are leading to crimes and young generation committing crimes how to know that children are facing mental depression how to deal with them i think it's all about behavioral changes i think uh, i think that's oh my god the mental health stories that i've written about have been have really uh, they really upset me when i was writing about them you know one of the chapters that really really upset me because the kind of stories and you know the kind of reactions and that self harm and you know stuff like this is it really bothered me and uh, i think uh, again you know you have to look out for behavioral changes i i i watch my children like a hawk i you know if i sense that something i, I and there's a lot going on during covid right now you know as i say then you know when even when lock, the lockdown happened i mean we didn't really look at our children we said oh my god now we're locked in what are we going to do how are we going to work we have to work from home how are we going to exercise we can't go out so we're going to you know do a, a zoom yoga and zoom trainer oh, okay nothing else we're going to go bake some banana bread and sort it and here here's your gadget you go and do your online studies you see the halat of these children today they're struggling they're struggling i see my younger one you know i see that face drop ever so often these days and i know she she hasn't been we haven't been to india the whole year i mean she hasn't been to india the whole year she's missing her you know her family her pair, uh, her relatives her grandmoms her friends and and i sense that you know i mean and the the, the crying episodes have increased 
So you, we have to all look out. And I think it, mental health issues have only increased, although they were really big to begin with, but they've really increased during the pandemic. And I think we have to talk, as I said, keep talking to them, keep watching out for any signals, any signs. But uh, I think the larger issue though is that our society doesn't take uh, mental health very seriously when it comes to children. And I think that is something that we need to change because we all actually dismiss it as saying, Ki to bachche, what problem will they have? They have plenty of problems today. They have plenty of issues. And I think today's generation has a lot as compared to what we had. So we have a question from Kuljeet Kaur. She's raised her hand. Can we have the question? Kuljeet, can you please unmute? Kuljeet, can you please unmute yourself? Shweta, you can move on. Yeah, we can move on. Okay. Uh, do we have more questions in the Q&A? Yes, we have. Yeah, we have from Deepta. Deepta says, how do we handle our child who wants to be on social media because the whole class is active on it? They should... Otherwise, they would feel left out otherwise. My child, my child's whole class is on social media, but she's not. And, uh, you know, to give you an example from the book of a, uh, a 15 year old or a 16 year old, I don't know if I, I forget if I mentioned her already, who hasn't given her uh, child a phone and she says, you know, I'm going to give it up to, the, you know, he's 16 and he's just giving his exams and I'll give it. And I, me, I, I'm, I'm telling her, no, I think we should give it now. And uh, so she, she said that, you know, initially uh, as a parent too, there's a lot of peer pressure, right? I mean, if everybody's friends, children are doing things. And I see that peer pressure as well myself because all my children's friends here are always on social media or on an or iPad or, you know, a phone and mine don't. And uh, so I say, and, you know, so she said, I went through a really bad phase where, you know, I had to struggle with myself, not giving it to him. And he was the only one in the class. I think he's the only one in the school at the age of 16 who doesn't have a phone, to be honest. But, uh, you know, so she said eventually now look at him. I mean, he, he comes to me and he says, I'm really grateful you didn't give it to me because it was, it was, it would really have not helped me learn other things, you know, like he's become this amazing guitar player and he's doing concerts online. And, you know, he's, he's, he's figured out his space and his place in life. And uh, so she says that, you know, not one person came up to me and said that, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, why aren't you giving him the phone? Every single parent who came up to me said, you know, you're doing the right thing, but how did you manage it? We're so envious. And I think that's the bottom line. We've got to be persistent. There's peer pressure for them. There's peer pressure for us, you know. We, we, will, we will be the bad mothers for a while, but we are anyway. And, uh, you know, I think we have to, um, if, if, if it's your belief, stay with it. I stay with mine, you know. I, I hear this from my daughter every time. <laughs> oh, okay, next year, will you give me one phone? So we'll see. Oh, yeah. Nice. If you're able to manage, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we have a question from... Uh, uh, hi, hi, is there any reasonable or sensible time limit as far as playing mobile games on daily basis is concerned? I think this is more or less answered. Yeah, I think everything in limit is... Yes, yes. How to curb net addictions? You know, I always say that uh, prevention is better than, uh, you know, later uh, measures taken later. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same thing, you know, encourage them to do other things. I mean, okay, so now, <laughs> that's what I say. Now in the pandemic, how, how many, my children say, how many books can we read, Mama? Now we've read, tell us what to do, you know? So I say, well, tell me what you want to do. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're building things and they're painting and they're, you know, but they, they, they get bored too because I'm not allowing it. But I do encourage, it's not like I, there's no TV in my house, there's TV, but I mean, there's TV you watch, you watch, you know, they're watching the India-Australia match right now, they watch the news. And, uh, you know, so you, I think it just comes down to the kind of uh, teaching you give them. I, mean, I, was, I have checks and balances in place, even for the fact that, because they're studying on gadgets. So I need to know, you know, I'm not constantly sitting there to know what they're going on when they're uh, studying from 7.30 to 3.00. Uh, but I do, I do get an email every week showing me what websites they've gone to that are not part of anything that I've been to. And I think Nidhi listening in will be really happy that my elder one was on, is every week is on ndtv.com, bbc.com, you know, msn.com. And I was like, I know, so I'm like, you know, just for this, I think you're going to play a little bit more games, you know. So I think it just comes down to how you teach them what to do. I mean, they're, they're watching cricket matches in my house. They, I, I, you know, now I tell them go down, the weather is good. Uh, cycle a little bit, go out, run a little bit. I mean, we're all stuck inside. 
a trainer for me and a trainer for them because you know you need to exercise too they're getting lazy and they're also getting uh, and you're going to find that you know they become a bit anti social when they come out of this right okay we have this another question for you using video calling apps in this pandemic time are considered that these sites are misusing personal data how to know which video app like zoom are okay for us or not no i think zoom zoom i, I don't think there've been any complaints i think there was actually in the middle but everybody seems to be using zoom so you know i think we're all okay but i, I don't think we need to give away anything too much uh, in, in, on anything you know keep it uh, professional and i think it's okay hmm. it, it is the way right now we don't have an option right okay this is something very different whether traditional yoga supports the knowledge development of students this is a scientist dr r is gajender you know i believe in yoga but uh, i find that uh, so when they're in school and there were yoga classes they would do it but i find that this uh, uh, you know i think this generation does need yoga lessons i actually think that they need for it to you know to calm them down and I, i like my elder one refuses to do it because you know she's always hyper and she's always jumpy and you know she will do the trainer session but she won't do the yoga session because mom it's too slow but i think they need it i think they need to calm down a little bit come down and you know get that balance going and i think it's absolutely essential for schools to have yoga lessons i believe in it yes yes it definitely uh, controls their breathing and their hyperactive nature um we have a question from uh, nareesh sharma madam please mention some important tips for cell phone decorum especially in case of teenagers like i said you know as as long as you can help it it shouldn't be a smartphone uh, no no youtube no no games no chrome no google no nothing just a phone as long as you you know no whatsapp as long as you can hack it otherwise if you can't and you they are on whatsapp i think you should put timings and you know they and you can put timing so i mean you know it's it's the same thing like you know on, on their gadgets right now because of work also if they if they if they have to go beyond that school hours they, that permission comes to me you know i get a, i get a notification saying that you know she's asking for more time on the gadget so i think there are checks and balances there is things like net nanny that all kinds of things available out there to keep track of your, you know how your ch- child is spending especially the, the hours that they spend you know i i get a report on how many hours my children have spent every week on the gadget every week that's really nice so i think there are more questions and there's no end to this this topic is so intriguing and uh, you um, so if we um, no i think let's anandita let's sort of wrap up or should i take one more question uh, you can take one more question that's the last one Okay um uh, 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 let's take up another question then uh, is it really important to make children conscious of these issues as a problem i guess every age has its own set of difficulties for children and fortunately most of us get over them as we grow don't you think the will to survive develop those antibodies to fight these vices no i think it's very important to tell them uh, what is out there like i said i normalize existence of these things i normalize the fact that uh, you know kids may be smoking or that kids are on drugs or or there are strangers on the internet who who may approach you for all the wrong reasons i i i i completely talk about it very very openly i talk about the fact that you know kids have been found to uh, uh, you know found getting intimate in school at at a very young age and you know waited out and uh, these kind of things and i i do have conversations that i'm constantly told that you know this zamana is not Uh, the same as your zamana mama things have changed and you know uh, uh, people are dating since the age of 11 12 and i'm like okay whatever you know but we'll tackle with it but, but i keep these conversations open i agree that you know things change when they go into college and you know i think social media loses its impact a little bit uh which is why i think uh, the, the focus of my book has been school years because this is when the the fo- uh, you know when the impact of social media is the the largest and the highest and the you know the deepest in fact on children and uh, so yeah i think you should absolutely talk about these issues i think as parents we need to i think you'd be surprised the amount of children who written in saying that you know how can we talk about these issues to our parents after my book was released so i think uh, yes you'd be surprised that your child may actually be waiting for you to have that conversation yes we don't even realize that yeah yeah really very true 
So uh, the session is so intriguing, you know, and I don't feel like the session should get over. There's so much to ask and so much to learn from you. But as the time doesn't permit us, so I would say, like to say on behalf of Prabhakatan Foundation, I would like to thank Jyotsnaji, Nidhi Rajdan, Banu Ahuja, and the Fulkari women of Amritsar for such an interactive and informative session. The session really had a lot of takeaways home and I hope we all are going to learn and benefit from it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And please get the book. It's available on Amazon, Flipkart and across bookstores. Thank you. Thank you.